Hi, my name is Mike Gabin and welcome to my KSP campaign. We are out here with the crew of the Korion 1 orbiting the moon, picking up temperature scans. Uh, you might recall that uh, I started this contract a couple of episodes ago. It looked like I only had one temperature scan to pick up at that time, but each time I picked one up, another one got spawned and always to the east, making it pretty hard to uh, take advantage of the moon's rotation to uh, pick each one up. So this one's taking quite a bit of time. We're just about there. We'll pick up the scan. And yeah, I can see there's another one. Yep, there it is, the fifth one. Let's get rid of this. Why don't we take a look at uh, where this one is at. But it's following the pattern. Yep, there it is, towards the east of us once again. Uh, I kind of predicted that, so I'm getting less frustrated <laughs> with this thing. Um, in fact, a, a last episode I mentioned that I'd gone well over halfway around the planet with these waypoints, but the fact is actually that's not the case. Now, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Uh, why don't we open up the big map? You can see it on here. And there's a crater there in the eastern hemisphere, just below the equator, a large crater. You can see the flag indicators. Don't look at my mouse, I'm confused. But that was the original landing spot, and the first waypoint was actually just barely to the east of that. So you can see we've perhaps gone maybe three quarters of the way around the moon. So I think what I'll do is I'll stick with this um, until I've gone around the moon. And if by then, I don't know, it's still spawning waypoints, then something clearly is wrong. And I'll just uh, use the debug menu to give myself this contract anyway. But you might recall also that uh, the moon's not the only place that I have cripples in orbit around something. This is Minmus Station. And its newest residents, its first residents, who only arrived at the end of the last episode, are Svetlana, Chrissy, and Glafia. They just got here, but I already have itchy feet, so I want to send them on a mission. i got to check Glafia's inventory. Okay, she's got her tools. She's going to need that. But she's going to need something else here, so we'll open up our main inventory. We're going to need some explosives. No, we're not going to need five of them, so we'll split that up. We'll bring those explosives over there. Yeah, you see, um, their main mission is actually to rescue a Kerbal and her command pod that is down on uh, the surface of Minmus. But for that, they need the Eagle 3, which should be launched soon, probably the beginning of next episode. But in the meantime, we've got the original Kegel in orbit about Minmus. It's been orbit around Minmus for a long time. Long time viewers might recall this particular vessel. It was the first lander to put Kerbals down on the surface of alien worlds. It put Chrissy, who's actually on this mission, so she has some sentimental attachment to this vehicle. It put Chrissy down on the moon, and then it put Bob down on Minmus. And then after that, I just I just left it here. Uh, I drained it of all its fuel, as I recall. I think I filled it full of poo, too. And, uh, and I just left it there in orbit with no real plan for it. And it's only a one-person lander, and I don't really have any good idea what to do with it. The thing is, is it runs on conventional liquid fuel and oxidizer, so, and I have no oxidizer... The Karayan 2 is nuclear and doesn't carry any oxidizers, so um, I don't even know. I can't even fuel it up and get it out of here, so I think I'm just going to blow it up. Yeah, perhaps a bit of an ignoble end, but I don't know, maybe we can think of it as a, as a Viking funeral. Yeah, why don't we think about it that way? So what we're going to do first, I am just past my relative uh, descending node with my target orbit, the Kegel's orbit. So uh, this would be the right time for us to uh, push up our apoapsis. So I'm just going to burn prograde. Uh, you can see that I'm still having issues with the engine animations. The engines are working, but I don't have any flame effects. But I just burned until my apoapsis was about a day in the future, a day ahead of me. And that pushes the relative ascending node with my target orbit way out here, far away from Minmus, where I'll be moving very, very slowly, which makes my 
uh, inclination change that I'm going to have to make much cheaper. So we'll set up a maneuver for our inclination change. Now our relative inclination is 94 degrees, which makes it a little tough to tell which way I should rotate the plane of my orbit. You want to get this right because if you get it wrong, you're going to be 180 degrees out of phase. You're going to be going in completely the wrong direction. So I'm just going to time warp and I'm watching the Krayan and I'm watching the Kegel. And the Kegel is going up in its orbit and the Krayan is also currently going up or north in its orbit. So I need to rotate uh, clockwise. I need to rotate. Nope, that's the wrong direction. I need to rotate the other way. There we go. So we're doing an anti-normal burn. Yeah, you definitely want to get that right because if you're 180 degrees out of phase, like that's as your, your encounter speed is going to be a little bit ridiculous because you're going to be going completely opposite directions. So uh, uh, be careful about that one. Anyway, while I'm setting up this particular maneuver. Why don't we talk about what else is coming up in this episode? Well, I think the highlight is going to be me testing and playing around with a new nuclear powered turbojet engine. Um, yeah, I want to get more into the nuclear powers that comes with Kerbal Interstellar. So uh, I'll be playing around with that and talking about that. I think that will be quite a bit of fun but as you can see here I'm closing in on the completion of this particular maneuver. It's going to be well, about a day in the future for me to do this. So why don't we go on to uh, another launch? This is to finish off a contract that actually I started a few episodes ago to recover um, part from low carbon orbit. Um, part is a 1.875 meter fuel tank uh, from homegrown rockets. In fact, it's actually I believe the same style of fuel tank that is on the main lifter of this particular vehicle. Here we're about to lose the booster so see it. There it is, that guy there, that lifter. That's what I need, well something like that though empty that I need to get back down to the surface. And uh, a few episodes ago I used the Karayan 2 to shuffle it over to Kerbin Station and then I just docked it with the station and I've left it there. So this particular vehicle is just designed to bring that thing back down to Kerbin surface safely so I can finish off that contract. Okay, there we go. We've had main engine cut off. All right, and uh, it's just a little bit of a space tug, really. There's not much more to it than that. You'll see it right here. There goes the fairing. Oh, we got a little chunk of fairing stuff there. There it is. And it's got a lot of uh, KAS parts. Whoa, come on, get off. You can do it. There you go. Just need a little nudge. Okay. Um, a lot of KAS uh, parts on there because what it's going to do, it's going to dock with this fuel tank. And then we're going to use some struts to really secure it very, very well. And then we're going to use this thing to descend it. It uh, also has at the front there, you can see a bunch of air brakes. I'm going to use the air brakes to make sure that the whole configuration goes down with the orientation that I want it to have. So if I put air brakes towards what will be the prograde end, the front end of it, and deploy them, that will bring the center of lift really towards the front of the whole thing. And then that way, uh, it will go down in a direction that I want it to go down. There we are. We have now achieved an orbit. So let's open up the air brakes. I know it sort of looks like I went for this kind of pedal effect with it. That's actually not where I was. What I was shooting for. Uh, that was just the most convenient place to stick them. But it does kind of look good when I open it like that. And I have to open it like that so that I will be able to dock. And at the back there, you can see that I have a heat shield. The whole thing is powered by nothing but monopropellant. So uh, we got some of those radio monoprop engines as sort of the main engines, and then uh, some thruster blocks around it so that I can perform the docking. So here we are at the station, and I've got the docking port at the end of the tank that I want to descend, targeted. And of course, once we have this docked, we're going to have to send out our engineer to do some construction. And our engineer today is Bartner. Bartner's all by himself aboard the station, taking care of things, and he's going to have to do this all on his own which should be all right. Now, I am a little bit concerned because I think these air brakes look too big to fit into his personal inventory. Let's see. Try to put that in there. Yeah, they're too big. So we're going to have to get a KAS container 
to be able to move those about. So what we'll do instead for now is we'll take these parachutes. As you can see, two of them fit into his inventory without any issue. Now how many I can fit in there? I got four all together and I want to attach them toward to what's going to be the forward end of this vessel. Right now we are at the aft end. Three fit. Can I get the fourth one in there? Oh yeah, four parachutes. No problem whatsoever. So like I said, we're going to attach these more or less symmetrically, as symmetrical as I can, to the forward end of this. And then we're going to have to get those air brakes. And for that, Bartner has picked himself up an empty KAS storage container. It's going to be a little tricky. He's going to have to do this all himself. He can't access the storage container while it's on his back, so he's going to have to put it down. There we go. Oh, it seems to want to be sticking there. That's good. Now we can get in there and we can start grabbing the air brakes. In the past, I've done this with two Kerbals. You can get a second Kerbal. It doesn't have to be an engineer to kind of hold on to the uh, container, and then uh, the engineer can start to use it. But Bartner's going to have to do this all by himself. He seems to be doing an all right job. Let's see, we've gotten two of the air brakes so far. Can we get this? Well, I'm having trouble just reaching the third one. Okay, can we get the third one in there? No, we can't. Two air brakes are all that's going to fit. So we're going to have to grab the container and we're going to have to take it towards where we uh, are going to need to install those air brakes. You know, I really should bring up more of these containers, just empty ones. Uh, I'm using them more than I thought I would. And uh, what I also should bring up are more of those, um, just the clamps that you use to attach them to things. It'd be nice instead of having to put them down and let them float about to actually clamp them to things. If I had some extra clamps, that'd be great. But, oh, it seems to be stuck in there. That's good. All right, so we're going to attach. No, that's going to be backwards. I got to spin this all the way around. There we go. Attach that. All right, just three more of those to go. And then all we got left to do is to connect some struts. Uh, I got a total of four struts here to really connect my tug to this fuel tank so that uh, everything is nice and solid as it descends through the atmosphere. But uh, connecting these struts are pretty easy. All right, that's it. Let's take a look at what we got here. Oh, that ain't coming apart anytime soon. Excellent. So we'll put Bartner back into the station. We'll also transport transfer uh, as much monoprop as we can out of our tug. The tug has a ton of monoprop in it and was able to completely fill all of the monoprop tanks that are attached to this particular station. But then it was time to uh, get this show on the road and uh, descend this thing. So we'll undock from the station, back away just a little bit. Toggle the torque back on on those reaction wheels. Yeah. Okay, I want to spin this around to the retrograde vector. I'm backed away enough now. Here we go, and let's actually get us sort of moving a bit in that direction so that we can perform our descent burn without having to worry about crashing into the station. And of course we're going to use trajectories to help us plan our descent. And I want to put it into the ocean just to the east of the Kerbal Space Center. There we go, that looks good. Right about there. And then I did... Oh, I've done this mistake a number of times. You would think I would stop at some point, but I did a dopey thing. I said, oh, well, I don't need all of this extra monoprop that's still on this anymore. So why don't I reduce my mass by uh, dumping this excess monoprop, which seems like a good idea. Less mass is a good thing as to help you descend and decelerate more quickly. But unfortunately, uh, less mass also changes uh, your descent trajectory through the atmosphere. You will not carry as far as you would have when you had more mass and so I ended up with my uh, predicted landing spot well right in the middle of the continent here. <laughs> Otherwise you can see that it is tracking well. The air brakes are certainly doing their job as well as the heat shield at the front. Nothing is heating up 
in any sort of scary way. The Communitron, amazingly enough, is still attached, so uh, I still have control of this thing. Remember, I am playing with remote tech, so if, the, if I descend the Communitron, uh, I lose control, but also if it breaks off, I lose control, which is okay. I, I'm sort of anticipating a loss of control. The parachutes are armed and will... Let's rotate this a little bit, see if I can adjust where I'm going to land and... Oh, okay, well, there goes the Communitron. So that's that. <laughs> I don't have control anymore, but like I was saying, the parachutes are already armed and uh, they are set to partially deploy at 7,000 uh, 7, meters and then fully deploy at 700 meters. We should be playing. Man, those air brakes slow this thing down quickly. This is the first time I've used air brakes on a descent, like full on like this. And it's amazing how much they slow down. We are way below the speed of sound already. What's our altitude? Getting up to 10 kilometers. Remember again, at seven kilometers, those parachutes will deploy. They best deploy. Wow, there they go. All right, now the thing I am worried about, I was hoping this would land in the water. Instead, it is landing on the land. Uh, the slope is under five degrees. So I'm hoping it won't fall over. <laughs> That's the thing I'm most worried about is that this thing will fall over and uh, and break. And so what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to kind of cheat a little bit. If, if that recovery thing comes on, I'm just going to click it. Recover, recover. Yes, there it is. <laughs> so I didn't give it a chance to fall over. And that finishes off the contract to pick up and recover that fuel tank so great that and that also of course is going to give me an opportunity to pick up another contract and I have this uh, do mm -hmm. some crew mm -hmm. reports some high altitude aerial crew reports over Kerbin and I happen to have my high altitude jet the Otter 3 sitting in the hangar so you know I'm gonna be picking that one up this being of course an entirely routine mission that I'm not going to spend much time with but uh, I do want to take the opportunity draw your attention to the nav ball, specifically the waypoint on the nav ball. Uh, yeah, and I, just, I guess I should mention that uh, I was actually playing, this was my play session on April the 1st. So uh, someone's having a, either a mod developer or squad is having fun with uh, April Fool's Day. I also had the distinct pleasure of having a Nyan Cat streaking across my loading screen while I was booting up KSP along with my normal loading bar. But anyway, uh, oh, we are here, so let's pitch up and fire up those afterburners. And we gotta get ourselves up to an altitude of over 17.3 kilometers. But for the Otter 3, that's going to be no problem whatsoever. Yet this has been a very awesome plane for me for quite a number of episodes. You've seen a lot of it. And I'm going to have to announce this is likely going to be the last you are going to see of it. Yeah, yeah, I hate to, I hate to retire planes, but you know, everything has to come to an end. And uh, once I completed this mission, I got right into playing with these nuclear thermal turbojets that come from Kerbal Interstellar Extended. And I'd rather spend the time on this video talking about those than showing you this routine mission. So I'll show you that. There you go. I got that one. The other two, of course, pretty much the same story. So why don't we get ourselves over to Kerbal Construction Time Simulation Mode. This is a prototype Otter 5 that I'm working on. And it features two, here, let's click on it, a direct cycle nuclear turbojet engine. And this is just going to be a test of, the thrust is crazy, I'll, I'll point that out right off the bat. So I'm just going to point it straight up and I want to see just how high I can get this thing because what I'm thinking about is, you know, replacing the Otter 3 and the Otter 3 was my high altitude survey jet and so this is going to be my new high altitude survey jet. And um, I don't spend a lot of time showing you my testing. 
So I wasn't really thinking I was going to show you this, but this came out, I don't know, so cool that I thought I would show it to you. So I do apologize it for being at night. I also didn't use the ambient light uh, mod to adjust the lighting. One thing that's a little wild when you have two of these turbojets going is their thrust varies depending upon the temperature of the reactor. And they always are a little bit asymmetric. So you gotta keep an eye on them and uh, adjust <laughs> the thrust limiter make sure the thrust stays pretty close to being relatively balanced. So all I'm doing, as I said, is pointing straight up and you can see they are doing great. I have to take a look at where normally the fuel is. It says atmosphere down there at the bottom left. And I'm keeping an eye on that and making sure these engines don't flame out. One, uh, unlike the stock engines, if these fl flame out, uh, I have yet to be able to figure out how to get them to turn right back on again. They kind of just shut down and are down for good. So I'm just going up and up and like I said, I don't want them to flame out. So just before that atmosphere gauge gets out, I think I'll just shut these off. There we go. But if you take a look at my Apoapsis height, 75 kilometers, that's space, man. <laughs> This thing is going to space. Now, going to space, going straight up, I will be the first to admit that. It is not going to get into an orbit. The engines are of no longer any use, but man, this thing is going into space. And while we make our way up to Apoapsis, why don't we talk a little bit more about the engines. As mentioned, they are nuclear powered, which is a little hard to miss given the two very large radiation warning symbols that are stamped right on the engines. Uh, they come from Kerbal Interstellar Extended. They are nuclear turbojet engines. And what that means is that they use a nuclear fission reactor with enriched uranium to uh, power the reactor. So its fuel is really uranium. And then it's using the atmosphere as a propellant, superheating it and extending it out the back. Now that means a number of things. Number one is as long as you have uranium, you have fuel and you are able to fly. Uh, this thing will fly for days before <laughs> the reactors uh, start to run low on fuel. So from now on, uh, fuel is not going to be a concern getting anywhere I want to on the planet of Kerbin. Number two is it's not using the oxygen that is in the air. It's just using the air as a propellant. So any atmosphere will do, including, for instance, like EVE, you could take this thing to EVE if you could get it there and it would fly. And I just want to point out, we are in space. Jeb, we're in space. Okay, in simulation mode, but what the heck? It's space, right? <laughs> and I was originally thinking about this thing simply as a high altitude jet that I don't have to worry about running out of fuel with. But uh, now, space planes? Don't you think? I think I should be able to... Uh, concoct a space plane out of this thing. Now, the, you know, this is going to be on its way back down. In fact, uh, we're still going up. We're still going up. We must be very close. To, oh yeah, we're just, we're on our, there we go. We are starting to come back down now. Um, and the engines, again, I can't fire them up because they don't have any atmosphere to use as a propellant. So uh, this is not staying in space at all. It's going back down. But, um, if I want to make a space plane out of it, I'm going to need some sort of rocket engines to go on there as well. And also, I need to get an ascent profile that's not what you're seeing here. This is obviously a very inefficient ascent profile. Um, so there's a number of bugs. There are things I still got to work out. One of the things I got to work out is landing. Now, uh, actually, getting this thing back under control once it was into the thicker part of the atmosphere once again uh, turned out actually not to be all of that difficult. However, it is quite a lot heavier, and I think I got spoiled with uh, some of my planes that had this spectacular glide ratio that, uh, you know, you could glide into the runway at pretty low speeds. So here you can see that my sp I've allowed my speed to drop too low and, and coming a bit short. Ooh, and down. I got the lip of the runway coming up. Oh! Jeb's still here. <laughs> okay, so working on landings, that's going to be job number one. Job number two is working on ascents. If I want this space plane, I can't do that silly ascent that you saw me just do before. 
So here I'm trying uh, what would be a normal sort of a space plane type ascent, though I'm probably, no probably about it, I think, I think my pitch is a little bit too low. But what I want to do is try and see if I can get my apoapsis out of Kerbin's atmosphere while going through you know, a, a, a more shallow type of ascent. I should mention at this point, by the way, that uh, Interstellar Extended also comes with a nuclear turbo ramjet engine, which is designed for high speeds that these guys aren't. So I, I might need to get that involved in the mix. Uh, I've not played with it too much just yet, but you can see here, uh, I am getting a little bit of uh, heating issues. And I'm also getting some asymmetric thrust because those engines are about to flame out. Okay, I got a... Oh! Oh, something exploded. And judging by that, all I have here is the cockpit falling, that I think that was the crew cabin. Oh, that's not a good feature to have in space plane exploding crew cabins. There must be some ideal ascent that is steeper than what I was doing there, but obviously shallower than what you saw me do first. But I wanted to work still on the landings. So I put aside the idea of a single stage to orbit space plane for now, uh, mostly because I do have another idea, another design for a space plane that is in the works, that is in the building queue, so that you will be seeing that uh, hopefully in a very, very soon to come episode. Uh, so I want to kind of get that going first. But uh, in the meantime, I thought, you know, I'll go back to the idea of this just being a high altitude survey jet. Uh, but I wanted to make sure I can nail some landings before I started doing this for real. So I did another one of these uh, shooting straight up into space type of deals. Uh, I'll admit it, mostly because it was fun. <laughs> I don't know what practical value this has, but it certainly looks good. And you can see that uh, I've now got this thing kitted out. It's got various lights and blinky things. So you can see it a whole lot better than before. And in fact, I am actually just shy of 70 kilometers, unfortunately. So not quite covering the uh, KSP version of the Carmen line, but oh, we'll call it close enough. And uh, I'll also admit that I'm doing this for the beauty shot. <laughs> there, there, I, that, that, that there, that's my beauty shot right there. Um, but I also wanted to do something that's a little bit more adventurous and see if I can take this and put it down onto the runway. I want to keep my speed up. I want to stall like last time, so I'm going to throttle up here a little bit. I notice this thing does need to land with a little bit more velocity than my previous planes. My previous planes, I could be like 40, 50 meters per second and land them without an issue. This guy, well, I can't let it get that slow, so we'll throttle up a little bit. I do have to be a bit careful because these engines produce a shocking amount of thrust when the, when the air is thick. Okay, here we go. See, I'm less than ideally lined up. Fine, let's get down, down, and touch down. Okay, whoa, whoa, there we go. Okay, brake. I'm braking. Oh my goodness, <laughs> this thing is so heavy. Oh, maybe I need to get in there and turn up the brake torque. Come on, brake, 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 brake. Am I going to stop before the end of the runway? Please tell me I'm going to stop before the end of the runway. <laughs> I think I'm going to be okay. Yes, and uh, I think I'm also going to make this the conclusion of this particular episode. We'll get to the Kegel 3 and lots of other goodness in the next episode. But we'll just make sure that I don't drive off the end of the runway, but I actually do think I am going to come to a stop. Yes, there we go. So like I was saying, we'll be getting to the Kegel 3 in the next episode, the launch of that. We will be getting to back to our two Karines in orbit around the Minmus and the Moon. Hopefully we'll get some rescue missions going as well. But all of that is going to have to be for future episodes. In the meantime, I thank you for watching and hope to see you next time.